Imagine this. You're getting dressed one morning and go to your closet and take out your favorite cashmere sweater. You pull it over your head, pulling your arms through the sleeves. And as you're pulling it down and smoothing it over your midsection, you notice a small hole. You look closer and see that there are several holes right in the middle of your sweater. Here's another scenario. You come home one evening and notice a moth flying around your house. You're able to shoo it out the door and you don't think anything of it. But then, later on, you notice another moth flying around and another one, and you start to wonder if you have a problem. Well, if you've experienced anything like these situations or you want to avoid anything like these situations, then keep on watching to find out the truth about clothes moths. Hi everybody and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. Today's show is all about the dreaded clothes moth that can eat your yarn and knitted items. I get so many questions about clothes moths and I also see a lot of misconceptions that are perpetuated through misinformation and misunderstanding. So I hope to help clarify some things today. I have scrutinized the entomological research as much as I could find to bring you the facts about clothes moths, how to avoid them, and how to get rid of them if they've moved into your house. Before I get into this, let me first mention that I did a show last year about clothes moths and other fiber-eating insects, which I'll link down in the information box below in case you missed it and wanna check it out. So today I'm gonna to reiterate some things, challenge some myths, and answer some questions about clothes moths. Let me start by saying that clothes moths do have a purpose in life, and it really has nothing to do with our yarn stashes or clothes in our closets. Like all native insect species, clothes moths are beneficial to the environment. In nature, clothes moths are the cleanup crew. They live around the nests of insects, birds, and other animals where they eat shed hair, horns, skin, and feathers that would otherwise accumulate and foul the environment. So they are kind of nature's housekeepers and help with decomposing protein materials. Unfortunately, these protein fibers are also found in many items we value, including wool clothing, leather goods, furs, and rugs made of natural fibers. But generally, clothes moths are not going to be attracted to synthetic fibers like acrylic or polyester unless they're blended with a natural fiber like wool. A lot of people have asked what clothes moths look like and also what clothes moth larvae and eggs look like. Well, there are two types of clothes moths. These are the webbing moth and the case making moth. The webbing moth is the more common of the two. Both of these moths look very similar. They're tiny, about one quarter inch long, with a wingspan of a half inch. The webbing moth is golden or buff colored with a satin-like sheen, and the head has a tuft of reddish hairs. The case-making moth is browner in color, usually with three dark spots on the wings and light colored hairs on its head. The eggs of both species are almost microscopic, less than one millimeter in diameter. They have been described as resembling the heads of sewing pins or looking like fine white dust. The larvae of both clothes moth species are also very small, about one half inch long when fully grown, and they look like tiny skinny worms with shiny white bodies and dark heads. These little caterpillars are the ones that do the damage. They are the ones who eat yarn and fabric. Adult clothes moths do not feed. They don't even have working mouths. Their sole purpose is to reproduce and they have very short lifespans. Clothes moth larvae are among the very few organisms that are capable of digesting keratin, a protein component of feathers, fur, hair, horns, antlers, hooves, nails, and beaks. 
Closed moth larvae, however, prefer to feed on items contaminated with organic materials such as spilled food and body fluids. They rarely feed on clean wool. Let me say that again. Closed moth larvae rarely feed on clean wool. They actually can't fully develop when eating only clean wool. Lab studies show that they don't get enough vitamin B from clean wool. Many of the components of vitamin B are found in things like perspiration, urine, fruit juices, milk, and gravy, which is why they're attracted to soiled fabrics. In studies, closed moth larvae were especially attracted to wool stained with human urine, human sweat, tomato juice, milk, beer, black coffee, and beef gravy. They were not attracted to wool stained with butter, tea, Coca-Cola, or sugar solution. In lab tests, when the caterpillars were given only clean wool to eat, they died of apparent starvation within two weeks. Other studies indicate that closed moth larvae are not attracted to lanolin, the natural oil on a sheep's body, and that's probably why you don't find closed moths hanging out on sheep. So there's a lot of research showing that closed moth larvae will not grow by eating clean wool. So that's one indication that your stash is probably safe. Their development is only possible on soiled cloth. And generally speaking, damage to clothing is usually restricted to parts soiled by sweat and other stains. So one key to preventing insect problems is to keep your stash and wool garments clean. Many people wonder if clothes moths live in their area, and it's really hard to say, but let me talk about their ideal environment. Clothes moth maturation is related not only to the quality of its food, but also to the temperature and relative humidity. The ideal environment for clothes moths is a temperature of 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 26 to 32 degrees Celsius. They also like high relative humidity, around 75% is best, although the webbing moth is tolerant to lower relative humidity down to around 20%. The closer conditions are to the ideal, the faster the closed moths develop and reproduce. In less than ideal conditions, they will still survive, but their maturity and reproductive rates will slow down. So, if you live in a warm, humid climate, then clothes moths are probably going to be more prevalent there. And the warmer and more humid your home is, this is going to create a more favorable environment for clothes moths. Those of you who live in the desert and other very dry climates probably have less to worry about. Research shows that compared to the populations of other moths, the population of clothes moths is relatively small. Having said that, they are found pretty much around the world. In 2017, English Heritage, an organization that serves as custodian to numerous historical sites and artifacts, conducted an ambitious study of the prevalence of clothes moths in England. Members of the public were given free clothes moth traps and were instructed to leave them out for a period of three months and then report how many clothes moths were caught in that period of time. Over 5,000 moth traps were handed out for the study. And in the three month span, an average of 17 clothes moths were caught in each trap. Clothes moths are widespread across England. However, the greatest numbers of clothes moths were captured in London with an average of 23 moths per trap. Also fairly high were the Southwest and West Midlands areas. According to this study, clothes moths were most common in homes built before 1950 and apartments with shared walls. Another study examined clothes moth prevalence in and around Berlin, Germany. From 2007 to 2008, researchers set up several trapping locations inside and outside the city limits. The traps set up were sticky traps containing a pheromone lure for male webbing clothes moths, which were changed every two weeks. The results of the study showed that the farther you got away from the city, the fewer webbing clothes moths were captured. 
The most closed moths caught in a single location in the city was around 50 over the entire year. So, like in the British Heritage Study, larger moth populations are being found in more densely populated areas. As far as closed moth prevalence in the United States, I found a ranking of the cities with the most closed moths as of 2017, and this list was compiled by a company called Insects Limited based on the number of closed moth traps purchased in each city. So here's the list starting with number 15, and that is Portland, Oregon. Number 14 is Orlando, Florida. Number 13 is Albuquerque, New Mexico. Number 12 is Wilmington, Delaware. Number 11 is Dallas, Texas. Number 10 is Seattle, Washington. Number 9 is Washington, D.C. Number 8 is Minneapolis, Minnesota. Number 7 is San Francisco. Number 6 is Chicago. Number five is Philadelphia. Number four is Santa Fe, New Mexico. Number three is Los Angeles. And number two is Boston. Can you guess the number one city for clothes moths in America? Well, it's our largest city, New York City. So from this list, you can infer that clothes moths are more problematic in bigger cities than in small towns and rural areas. But you can also see that clothes moths live all over the place in very different environments, from the heat and humidity of Dallas, to the cold snowy winters of Minneapolis, to balmy Southern California, to the more temperate climate of Philadelphia. And again, this is a trend similar to the studies in Berlin and in England, in that areas like the highly populated eastern seaboard seem to have more than their share of clothes moths. In these densely populated urban areas, it's easier for the moths to move from residence to residence. So if you live in a small town or rural area, you're probably at less of a risk. During their life cycle, clothes moths undergo a complete metamorphosis, just like other moths and butterflies. Female clothes moths deposit about 50 eggs in a food source. Eggs are attached to the food source with a sticky adhesive secretion. The eggs hatch in one to two weeks during the summer or in heated rooms. In unheated rooms or in the winter, hatching may take longer. After hatching, the larvae begin feeding and soon begin to spin some silk. The webbing moth larva spins silk as webbing over the fabric. This forms a temporary feeding tube. The case-making moth larva spins silk into kind of a sheath or a tube that they carry around with them as they move around. They never leave this silk tube and enlarge it as they grow. They feed from either end of the tube and retreat into it when disturbed. This tube or case takes on the coloration of the fabric that the larva is feeding on. The amount of time it takes for larva to mature varies greatly depending on the environmental conditions. Under ideal conditions, and as I said, they thrive in warm, humid climates, they can mature in 40 days. In less than ideal conditions, it can take two and a half years for the larva to mature and all that time they are eating. Once the larvae mature, they construct a cocoon and enter the pupa stage. Pupation takes from eight to 10 days in the summer and maybe three to four weeks in the winter. Heated buildings enable clothes moths to readily continue development even during the cold winter months. Adult clothes moths emerge and are ready to mate immediately. They find each other through pheromones, mate, and begin the cycle again, living only a short time. Females live for about three to 16 days. Once they've laid all their eggs, they will quickly die. Males live a bit longer for about a month. Generally, the developmental time for the clothes moth is about six months, so there are about two generations per year under ideal conditions. 
And as I said, less than ideal conditions will slow down their development. Unlike most other moths, clothes moths seek out dark, undisturbed areas to eat, mate, and reproduce. Adult clothes moths do not like bright lights. If they see light or are disturbed, they will quickly scuttle away into the darkness. Clothes moths are not strong flyers. An erratic, kind of faltering flight pattern is one unique characteristic of clothes moths. They just kind of flutter around, not like they're purposely flying somewhere. You are more likely to see them crawling on the wall than flying. If you disrupt an infested fabric, they often attempt to escape by running rather than flying. The females tend to make small jumps and walk along surfaces, while males may fly when they're in search of a mate. Because of their aversion to light, they prefer to live in quiet, dark areas of homes like closets, basements, and attics. That's why items that are stored for long periods of time are especially at risk. Clothes moths will generally live and feed in hidden areas like the inside of clothing, drawers, or underneath rugs. They rarely infest items that are used on a regular basis. So another tip is to keep moving things around. Regularly air out, brush, and shake things like blankets or clothes made of wool and vacuum undisturbed areas of your house frequently. If you see moths flying around your house during the day, they're usually not clothes moths, but more likely a plant-eating moth or one of several food-infesting moths. Most moth larvae eat plants, and some moths that are commonly seen in homes produce larvae that eat dry goods in, the, in your kitchen, like pet food or human foods like cereal, rice, and flour. A lot of people wonder how clothes moths get into somebody's house. Well, it's really hard to tell where the moths originally came from because there's so many ways they could get into your home. One way is through a single infested item. Maybe you bought a sweater at a secondhand shop or got a, an antique wool carpet from your grandma. Be aware of what you're bringing into your house and make sure you clean it thoroughly before putting it away. Also, even though they're not great at flying, it's possible for a female moth to fly into your house through an open window or a door and start laying eggs on your clothing or carpets. Or a moth can land on somebody's back and be transported into the home under a jacket collar. Something as simple as hanging up your coat in a public location, like a coat check, can cause you to bring them home. Another vector includes bringing in eggs on your shoes or on your pets. The eggs are sticky and easy to transfer around your house or to your neighbor's house without knowing it. You know, you could let your dog outside and he rolls around in the grass and picks up some clothes moth eggs on his fur. So there are a lot of ways that clothes moths could get into your house. All right, I thought I would take a few minutes to address some myths that continue to circulate in the fiber community. Here are some examples of statements I found on the internet just by doing a Google search for the term clothes moths. Here's a person who says that moths are eating their cotton camisoles and teas. This is someone who's finding holes in their clothing and jumping to the conclusion that it's clothes moths. However, clothes moths do not eat cotton. Bugs like silverfish, crickets, and cockroaches will eat cotton, but not clothes moths. In a few minutes, I'm gonna be talking about what could be causing holes in your clothes besides clothes moths. Here's someone who recommends putting items in heavy duty plastic bags in the freezer for an hour, which will kill any moth larva. Many people assume that freezing temperatures will control clothes moths, but that's not always the case. Clothes moth eggs are very hard to kill. In fact, leaving them in the freezer for months probably won't kill them. Larvae are inactive at temperatures below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but they may not die. Clothes moths have survived for long periods in unheated attics and barns, in old furniture, clothing, and blankets exposed to below freezing temperatures. 
Although lower temperatures will slow down or put a temporary halt on their activities, the closed moths are usually not directly killed by them. Here's one where the person is saying she places lavender sachets and fresh lavender in bunches to protect her wool yarn, sweaters, and socks. She says clothes moths don't like the smell and it keeps them away. Okay, this is a huge myth which has masses of people thinking they're protecting their garments and yarn stash with lavender. The truth is that lavender does not kill clothes moths, larvae, or eggs, and it doesn't repel them very well either. One study actually tested the effectiveness of lavender and some other strong smells at repelling clothes moth larvae. The researchers compared lavender, citronella, and eucalyptus, as well as a commercial moth-proofing insecticide. They soaked wool fabric samples in solutions of 20 grams of the respective ingredient per liter for 15 minutes and then allowed them to dry. They cut the fabric samples into discs that they placed into the bottom of different petri dishes along with 15 clothes moth larvae. So each wool sample had 15 larvae on it and the petri dishes were kept in a dark cabinet for 14 days. Here you can see the results of the study. There are six samples shown here. The top left one is a control sample that didn't have any moth larvae on it. And of course that one is completely intact. The top middle one is untreated and you can see it has quite a bit of damage. The top right one is treated with citronella. The bottom left is treated with lavender. The bottom middle is treated with eucalyptus. And the bottom right is treated with the commercial moth proofing agent. As you can see, the insecticide at the bottom right was the only one that prevented any damage whatsoever. Out of the citronella, lavender, and eucalyptus, the citronella actually had the least damage. I don't know about you, but when I look at this picture, I don't see where lavender was all that protective. Other studies have addressed the effectiveness of cedar because a lot of people believe that using cedar pouches in their yarn or storing hand knits in cedar chests will protect them from clothes moths. This belief stems probably from a 1952 study testing Virginia cedarwood oil vapor as a clothes moth repellent. The researchers found that 100% of larvae exposed to cedarwood oil vapor died within 24 hours. However, the concentration of cedarwood oil vapor was extremely high and took place in a controlled laboratory setting in closed containers. Although the authors of that study speculated that control of closed moth larvae would be possible in the closed environment of cedar chests. Subsequent studies have refuted that suggestion. It has been known for many years now that cedar oil does not affect eggs, pupa, adults, or larger larvae, and that cedar lumber loses its oil in only a few years. The scent of cedar might discourage moths from locating a food source or might prevent a male's ability to smell female pheromones, but really it's the physical seal of a well-made cedar chest that prevents entry of clothes moths and other insects. It's not the cedar. Okay, and here's a person that said you should store your fibers in heavy plastic bags because moths can chew through lightweight plastic. Now remember that moths don't have working mouths, so it's not the adults that are chewing through anything, but rather the larva. And actually there might be some truth to this, although there's a lot more research showing that pantry moth larvae eat through plastic and cardboard. Um, as far as clothes moths, the only research that I could find talked about one case of a webbing moth infestation at a London museum in 2008. The infestation was so bad that the larva had chewed through plastic wrappings around some stored costumes that were infested. The costumes had been in storage and not disturbed for about 10 years. So this was an extreme situation in an institutional storage setting. So is it possible that clothes moth larvae could eat through plastic? Yes, it's possible. But is it likely and something you need to worry about? Probably not. 
As a social psychologist, I see two phenomena at work in perpetuating all the myths about closed moths in the fiber arts community. One is called the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is a cognitive shortcut that helps us make fast decisions. And it works through what examples we can think of quickly. So for instance, people think that it's far more dangerous to fly on an airplane than it is to drive a car because we can easily think of many examples of airplane crashes that we've seen on the news. But the thing is that airplane crashes happen so rarely that when they do, they are big news. On the other hand, car crashes happen far more often and you just don't hear about them as much on the news. Statistically, flying is way safer than driving your car, but the availability heuristic makes us think of all those airplane crash examples that easily come to mind. And I think the same thing is true when knitters are wondering how they should store their yarn or their finished objects. And when you go online to look up ideas, you end up seeing dozens of horror stories of people talking about clothes moth infestations, and you don't see any blog posts of people who haven't had an infestation. So you get this lopsided view of how bad the problem is. I mean, clothes moth stories are interesting, they're relevant, and they're heartbreaking. But the truth is that most fiber artists have not experienced an infestation, but they don't go online to say that they haven't. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, so yeah, I think the availability heuristic makes it so easy to think of examples of problems with clothes moths when the actual likelihood of having an infestation is pretty small. The other phenomenon I think is at work here is called emotional contagion. Humans are highly sensitive to emotional signals in other people. Our own emotions are affected by other people's emotions. We read other people's emotions to show us how to respond to a situation appropriately. And I think what happens with the clothes moth situation is that people read all the stories about clothes moth infestations and the fear and the horror and the panic expressed by those individuals that it happened to. And now, I'm feeling scared and worried about my yarn being attacked, so I might get a little hysterical and run and put all my yarn into sealed plastic bags because I don't want that to happen to me. Now, if you really want to store your yarn in sealed plastic bags or plastic bins, that is a-okay. It's up to you. But know that plastic is probably not the best way to store yarn, at least your wool and other protein fibers. And this is true, especially if you're storing it for long periods of time. It's probably fine for short-term storage for a few weeks or something like that. I did a show earlier this summer about how to properly store hand knits, and I'll link that down below if you missed it and you're interested in watching it. And as I talked about in that show, a better option is to use fabric bags with zippers and you can get them like this one um, with clear plastic windows so you can see what's inside. But the bottom line is it's up to you. What makes you comfortable? If you just can't bear the anxiety of having your yarn out in the open, then by all means, store it in a way that makes you feel secure. It's not worth it for you to feel distressed over something like yarn storage. But if you're one of those people who hates keeping their yarn in plastic or put away where you can't see it and enjoy it, then I'm telling you it's perfectly okay to take it out and leave it out. Okay, so there are a couple of big questions that I still need to answer. One is how to prevent clothes moths from settling into your clothes closets and yarn stash. Really, you don't have to take drastic measures here. Clothes moths are fairly easy to deter. So here are some prevention tips. First, uh, the first line of defense is through housekeeping. Vacuum carpets and floors frequently, especially areas that don't get a lot of foot traffic, like under and behind heavy furniture, inside closets, and around the baseboards. Second, have your pets groomed regularly so that they shed less. Third, thoroughly wash or dry clean any wool garments that you're storing. You don't really have to worry about clothes that you wear regularly because they don't go undisturbed for long periods of time. 
And as I said previously, clothes moths are attracted to organic materials such as body oils, perspiration, and saliva that commonly accumulate on your clothes. So if you keep everything clean, this will go a long way in curbing any potential moth problems. Fourth, don't let stored items go undisturbed for too long. Unfold blankets and sweaters from time to time. Shake them out. Hang blankets, sweaters, and feather pillows outside in the sunshine a couple of times during the summer. Hot direct sunlight will drive away any moths or larvae. Number five, wool garments should be periodically hung in the sun and brushed thoroughly, especially along seams and in folds and pockets. Clothes moths and their larvae are strongly repelled by light and will fall from clothing when they can't find protection from the sun. Number six, keep your outside doors closed and make sure your windows all have tight fitting screens on them so that moths can't come flying into your house. Number seven, carefully inspect any used clothing, rugs, and furniture containing animal fibers like wool or leather before bringing them into your home. Specifically, check under collars, along seams, and in folds or crevices for any sign of larva and damage. Number eight, moth larvae hide under webbing or in tubes that they make from the fabric they're eating, making them hard to see. And also they're very tiny, so use a bright flashlight and mag magnifying glass and take your time to inspect items carefully. Number nine, keep your storage areas clean of dust, cobwebs, and pet hair because clothes moths are attracted to places where hair, fur, and lint accumulate. Number 10, use pheromone traps in your storage area. These traps attract male webbing moths, which are the most common ones, with the scent of the female. The male moths get stuck to the trap and take them out of the equation. Check regularly for signs of moth activity because finding adults is a sign that there are larvae somewhere. And you can get these pheromone traps on Amazon for like $10. As far as your yarn stash, honestly, it is probably fine sitting out as long as you move it around on a regular basis. I mean, look at yarn shops. All their yarn is sitting out, looking beautiful and readily available to pick up and pet. It's not stored in plastic bags or bins, and they have a lot more yarn than most of us do. As you can see behind me, I store my yarn out in the open, but I do go through it at least twice a year. I take it all down, and in the summer, I bring it outside and let it sit in the fresh air and sunshine for a few hours. Doing that reminds me of what I've got in my stash, but it also helps protect against clothes moths. They don't like to be disturbed and they don't like bright light. So if there were any bugs, they would be dropping off and finding another place to live. But I have never seen any signs of clothes moth or any other insects for over 10 years. Number 12. If you're more comfortable storing your yarn in some kind of enclosure, then consider storing it, especially wool yarn, in fabric bags with zippers. These will let the wool breathe and avoid mold and mildew problems, as well as keep out pests like clothes moths. Number 13, you can store your wool garments or yarn in a cedar chest, but be sure to line the chest with a cotton sheet so that cedar oil doesn't leach onto your items and ruin them. And again, be aware that the cedar chest will only be effective if it is well made with a tight fitting lid. One other issue I wanted to discuss today is finding holes in your clothing, because this is often the first sign that indicates you might have a problem with clothes moths. But how do you tell if the holes are caused by moth larvae? Well, get your magnifying glass out and look for some telltale signs. One way to tell is that some larvae leave behind a web that resembles dried mucus. You might also see silk tubes that are the same color as the cloth, or you might see tiny fecal pellets. The thing is that you usually won't find a completely clean hole in your garment, and you're probably not gonna find moths themselves hanging around the hole, like in this picture that is well circulated around the internet. 
I saw it all over the place when looking up what people are saying about clothes moths, and these aren't even clothes moths in the picture. Keep in mind that finding holes in your clothing doesn't necessarily mean that you have a clothes moth problem. There are actually a lot of things that can cause holes and fabric damage. For example, if it's a shirt or a sweater and you're seeing holes toward the bottom of the garment, it could be that it's rubbing up against the button on your jeans or a belt buckle that you wear, or even your car's seatbelt. The holes could also be caused by getting snagged on a multitude of things like the edge of a countertop. Another culprit could be laundering these items in the washing machine with garments that have sharp edges like zippers or the end of a, an underwire from a bra. Or maybe your washing machine or dryer tub has a little rough spot that the clothes are catching on. Also, overstuffing dresser drawers can cause items to catch on the edge of the drawer and create small holes. Other causes of holes could be mold or mildew. These can attack, weaken, and destroy natural fiber fabrics. There are also other insects that can damage fabrics, such as crickets, cockroaches, silverfish, and carpet beetles. Finally, holes in stored fabrics could be caused by mice or other rodents. Not that we would prefer to see our knitwear chewed up by other insects or rodents because that's a whole other problem. But the point here is that even if you do find holes in your clothing, don't jump to the immediate conclusion that you have a clothes moth infestation. The cause is likely to be something other than clothes moths. And what if you find moths flying around your house? Well, don't panic. Again, they're most likely to be pantry moths or moths that eat plants because those are the most common types of moths. But the best thing to do to be sure is catch one of the moths and put it in a sealed plastic bag. Take it over to your nearest university extension office. Their job is to address concerns like this and offer solutions. So they should be able to help with identifying what kind of moth you have. And then you'll know for sure. Okay, so the next question is, what should you do if you find evidence of clothes moths in your home? So here are some tips for ridding your house of clothes moths. First, you have to find out where they're hiding. Grab a flashlight and, and inspect every closet in your home for signs of infestations. Meticulously inspect items like wool blankets, wool garments, and feather pillows for holes, eggs, and larvae. Look for tiny white eggs about the size of a pinhead. Usually you'll find the clothes moth adults hanging around nearby the food source for their larvae. So that's one clue as to where to start looking. Second, put any affected articles into Ziploc bags or garbage bags, seal them up and take them outside. Using an old toothbrush, remove eggs and larvae from infested articles. If something is too damaged, you may have to just throw it away. Third, laundering items in hot water of at least 120 degrees Fahrenheit which is about uh, 50 degrees Celsius for 20 to 30 minutes will kill all stages of insects. This is the easiest and most effective way of controlling clothes moths in washable articles. But many wool items can't be washed in hot water, so dry cleaning might be the only appropriate option, and it does work well. Number four, Thoroughly vacuum and dust all over your house to remove any potential food sources. And fifth, place moth pheromone traps around your house in places where you suspect moths are breeding. Number six, anything that can't be washed or dry cleaned can be fumigated using dry ice. Place the item in a 30 gallon heavy duty garbage bag along with one half to one pound of dry ice. Do not let the dry ice touch your bare hands because it will quickly freeze your skin. Loosely seal the bag and allow the dry ice to completely vaporize. This will allow the air to escape and keep the bag from bursting. After the dry ice is gone, seal the bag tightly and let it sit for another three to four days. Proper fumigation like this 
will kill moths at all stages. Number seven, another recommended treatment for eradicating closed moth eggs is to use multiple cycles of freezing and thawing or freezing and heating. Museums rely on the freeze-thaw method, which involves 48 hours at zero degrees Fahrenheit and then slowly thawed for eight hours, then immediately refrozen again for 48 hours. Another method involves alternating freezing for several days and then heating at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Research has shown that it's the strong temperature swings that the eggs can't handle, so that's more likely to kill them than just putting them in the freezer. And number eight, what about mothballs? Well, home treatment of garments using mothballs is not suggested. Mothballs are very effective when used properly, but most people do not follow the instructions correctly. Mothballs must be used in an enclosed space, such as a storage container with a tight-fitting lid. Yes, mothballs will kill the moths, but the ingredients in mothballs are also very harmful to humans. They contain carcinogens and have negative effects from inhalation. A lot of people use mothballs improperly, just opening a box and leaving it in the closet. Putting mothballs in a closet is not going to be strong enough to kill moths and will pose a risk to anyone entering the closet and breathing the fumes. Mothballs are very toxic to people and animals, and their chemicals can be absorbed into the body when the vapors are inhaled. So I would strongly recommend against the use of mothballs. If you have a widespread infestation of clothes moths, it's better to enlist the services of a pest management professional. Okay, the last question I'm gonna to answer today is about moth-proof wool. What is it and does it work? Well, some yarn manufacturers make moth-proof wool, which is chemically treated to repel or kill moths that come in contact with it. The yarn is treated with a pesticide called Mitin FF, which works by killing the moth larva when they eat the wool. The chemical is formulated as a fine powder, which is added to the yarn in the dye bath at the same time as any coloring that's being applied to the yarn. The moth proofing agent adheres to the yarn in a similar way as the dye does. You might wonder if this chemical is safe for humans. So I read the information for this pesticide on the Environmental Protection Agency website. Mitin FF has been used in the textile industry as a moth proofing agent since 1948. The EPA lumps chemicals into four categories based on their toxicity to humans, where category one is the most toxic and category four is the least toxic. So Mitin FF is in category three for human health toxicity. This is the second lowest of the four categories. It is considered low to moderately toxic if swallowed, inhaled, or exposed to the skin. As far as effects on other animals, aquatic species are at risk with low levels of this pesticide, so fish and amphibians especially. It's slightly toxic to birds and slightly to moderately toxic to mammals, but it's extremely toxic to other insects like bees, which we definitely don't wanna kill. It also appears that Mitin FF has been banned in Europe for about 10 years, so I think it's only available in the United States. Now, I really didn't find a lot of moth-proofed yarns for sale, so maybe there's not a big demand for them. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's show. I know that was a lot of information, but hopefully it will help you sort out the facts versus fiction when it comes to clothes moths. I tried to answer as many viewer questions as possible, but if I didn't get to your question, leave me a comment below and I will try to answer it. Or if you have other tips that I didn't mention for pre preventing or controlling clothes moths, please share them as well. If you're interested in me doing another show about yarn eating bugs like carpet beetles and silverfish, let me know that as well. 
Also, please leave a comment and share your thoughts and experiences or any new questions about today's topic. And of course, you can always just say hi. I love hearing from you and reading about your take on the different things that I talk about. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I'll see you next time. And until then, have a sparkly week.